Hello and welcome back to 8-Bit Keys. In this episode, I want to show you this crazy Casio KX101 boombox keyboard hybrid. Um, I think this thing was made in 1986, although I have not been able to confirm that yet. Um, I think it may be one of the craziest contraptions that Casio has ever produced. Now this thing is not 100% working. Uh, the main problem is the cassette deck. I think the belt is broken, but it may have other issues as well. There's also some problems with the amplifier. There's weird, bizarre, random noises and stuff that come from it. And uh, there's, I think, some of the issues with uh, some of the uh, slider controls are not making good contact anymore and need to be cleaned. But despite that, um, before I try to repair this thing, I want to go ahead and try to review all of the things that are currently working. <laughs> and the reason is because I have read online uh, some horror stories about how difficult these things are to take apart and work on. And so what I'm afraid of is that uh, once I take it apart, I may end up making the thing worse or may, maybe not even get it put back together properly. So I want you to at least be able to see the stuff that works. <laughs> so uh, let's get right into it. As far as boom boxes go, the KX101 may have more actual buttons than any other boom box ever made. And to be honest, I'm not going to go over each and every button because I think this video would be three hours long if I did. This thing is also rather heavy for a boom box of this class. As you can see, it weighs in a little over 13 pounds, 3 ounces. And for you guys in the rest of the world that use the far more logical metric system, that's about 5.99 or essentially 6 kilograms. And that's without all of those heavy D-cell batteries in there. Well, let's turn this thing around. I want to show you the speakers. By the way, it does just get power from the standard two-prong AC cord, which was common with boomboxes in the 80s. However, this is different from the figure eight style cords that are more common on electronics today. The speakers are connected by these little wires. And then you can press the release button here and these speakers will just lift right off. Now, what the purpose of this is, I have no idea. But if you wanted, you could use longer cables like these and then put the speakers wherever you want. So if, for example, you wanted to arrange the thing like this, I guess you could. Next, I'll draw your attention to the function switch. It has four main modes of operation, keyboard, tape player, radio, and line input. Please ignore the dirty switch. I really haven't cleaned this thing up yet. I figured I'd do that when I take it apart. And of course, here's the main power switch over here. And you'll notice there's kind of a delay before it comes to life. So in keyboard mode, it works pretty much like you'd expect. I'll come back to this later. I'll try moving it over to the radio. Yeah, so um, the radio works fine and it seems to be decently clear. So let's try the cassette tape mode. I'm going to use one of Anders Jensen's tapes, since he is the one that donated this crazy thing to me. But when I press play, all you hear is this humming of a motor. And that's it. Doesn't seem to matter if it's play, fast forward, or rewind. Same story. I suspect the belt is broken. Literally nothing is moving in here. It also has a good amount of inputs and outputs, including a stereo line out, a line in, and microphone inputs. Apparently this thing has some sing-along type features too. Oh, and I also want to show you the battery compartment. So it actually takes eight D-cell batteries, which would add quite a bit more weight to this thing. But what's even more interesting is uh, what's hiding over here. I'll have to use a screwdriver to take this panel off. And look at that, it's a Casio RAM pack slot. Good luck finding one of those. They do show up on eBay from time to time. Uh, this one recently showed up, but it's in France and I wouldn't have time to wait for it since I've already started filming this video. But this is literally the only one on eBay and once it's gone, there probably won't be another one for a while. So the purpose of the RAM card was so that you could compose some music and then save it digitally to the RAM card and then, you know, play it back later. Well, interestingly enough, another option besides the RAM card would be to save the music to a cassette tape. Now, you might think that what I'm talking about is just saving the analog sound data to a cassette tape so you can play it back in your Walkman or your car stereo or something like that. But that's not actually what it does. In fact, ironically, the best I can tell, this unit can't actually do that. <laughs> but what it can do is it can save digital information to a cassette tape with your musical composition, uh, much in the same way that, say, an old Commodore, Apple, or Atari might have saved digital information to a cassette tape around that same time period. But for all the good it does me, because my cassette drive isn't working. <laughs> 
Ok, so I do want to demonstrate the keyboard some. So I'll plug in some wires to the line output to record from. But I want to draw your attention to another problem. If you take a listen to this recording I'm making, you'll hear random weird noises. These noises are audible from both the main speakers and from the line output. So there's no way to get a clean recording from this. But hopefully it won't be too terrible. I'd also like to mention that the keys on this thing are really small, similar to this Casio SA9 that I recently reviewed, although the boombox actually has an additional five keys. However, the sounds this thing makes are actually far more primitive and uh, more in line with the old Casio PT series keyboards that produce cheap square waves. In fact, the closest actual match in sound and features would be the Casio PT30, which I don't currently have. Um, however, uh, again, the boombox has a few additional keys. So let's try out the keyboard. The first thing I want to show you is how the notes alternate from left to right when you play. And just in case you couldn't hear that, uh, take a look at the recording here in Audacity. As you can see, it has four voice polyphony. Now, I wanted to play some songs for you, but the keys are so ridiculously small that it's nearly impossible to play anything complicated on this. My fingers kept bumping into each other, and finding the right key by feel alone is really tough. It's, it's really frustrating. <laughs> You're far better off trying to play simple songs like Chopsticks. Or this. Over here on the left, it has these little chord buttons, similar to the Casio PT series. They can only make one sound, which is an organ, but if you hold down the key, you can change two different types of chords. But also the keys are so ridiculously small, they're hard to use. You can change the instruments by pressing the tone button, and then selecting one of the nine instruments that are listed above the black keys. Well, they aren't black on this keyboard, but you know what I mean. Of course, none of these instruments sound particularly good. This is Piano 3. This is harpsichord. This is clarinet. This is horn. Here's flute. And last, this is mellow. But one problem with all of these instruments is that they're too high pitched. Fortunately, there is a transpose option, and you can go down 12 half steps. Or basically an entire octave. I found the keyboard sounds much better moving it down like this. This is a much more reasonable range of notes. Using this, the horn sounds kind of like a sawtooth wave of some kind. Another neat feature is the unison button. And what this does is it makes the keyboard monophonic, but it uses all four voices in a slightly detuned way, giving a neat sound. So uh, here's the clarinet again. That actually sounds pretty cool. Here's the organ. And the piano. And the harpsichord. Ok, so now we've reached the part I've been secretly dreading, which is I'm going to see if I can take this thing apart and hopefully fix it. Fortunately, I found a few tips online for disassembly, and I learned that it's necessary to pop off all of these switches on the front panel first. Some of these aren't too happy about coming off, like this one. 
However, other ones seemed to come off with little to no issue. Unfortunately, this main power switch was the toughest to get off. And then this happened. Lovely. Well, I'm not off to a great start, I can see. I turned my attention to some of these other little rocker type switches. And eventually back to this stubborn one. Eventually it did come off. And of course I have a whole bunch to do on the other side over here. Once that's all done, the next thing to do is turn it over and unscrew all of the screws on the back. I had already noticed that this power supply looked like it might be a removable piece. So once I was done with these four screws, I tried to pull it out, and sure enough, it does come out as a single unit. I suppose this was handy for fitting it with different power supplies for different regions. It connects right here with these little pins, and, uh, and this thing is surprisingly heavy. So here goes nothing. Wow. I'd better remove this ground wire. I'm actually going to put the screw back so that I don't lose it. Uh, this is one device I need to be super careful about remembering where things go. Now, uh, let's see if these ribbons will disconnect. And thank God they do. Holy cow, Manure. This thing is way over complicated. It's downright scary. I'll be honest, I'm tempted to close it back up right now and just say, forget it. Okay, so I need to remove this tape mechanism. And it looks like I might be able to remove it. But I think I'm going to start by removing the tape heads. Uh, the main reason being is that the wires are soldered in somewhere over here. And I think it'd just be easier to unscrew them. So that's what I'm going to do. Next, I'm going to unscrew the cassette mechanism. I'm not 100% convinced I can remove the mechanism without removing any of the boards. But the chances look good, so I'm going to go for it. It did require some careful maneuvering, but I was successful. Okay, so now that I finally get a closer look at the cassette mechanism, I realize the belt is not broken, but it has slipped off its pulleys. Naturally, I can put the belt back on, but the first question that comes to my mind is why did it slip off and will it happen again? Well, I did manage to reattach the belt, uh, but if I had any hope of seeing this thing in motion, I needed to reattach it to the rest of the system. So that's exactly what I did. I also reinstalled the power supply so that I could power this thing on. So I power the unit on, and then I move the selector switch to the cassette mode. And of course tried pressing play. Well, something happened. The little cap stand is spinning, but nothing else. I thought maybe I should put a cassette in there, one I don't care about of course. So uh, when I play the tape, the cap stand does pull the tape along, but the other reel is not spinning to collect the tape, and this will obviously never work. Okay guys. Uh, the moment of truth has arrived. So here's the thing. Um, this tape mechanism is ridiculously complicated. Uh, it's, it's not even mechanical in nature. This thing has got a lot of electronic parts. It's got little sensors and at least four or five little solenoids all through it. And you can't actually force this thing into, say, fast forward, rewind, play, or, or anything like that uh, because it all has to receive con uh, commands from this ribbon cable here. Now, I have spent the last several hours poking around at this thing and trying to figure out what's wrong with it. And from a mechanical perspective, once I put the belt back on, I can't find anything wrong. Yet, at the same time, one of the things that it does is that the little pinch wheel here actually does pull the tape. But neither one of these little gears that are supposed to you know, wind the tape in are, are working in either direction. And so again, I don't know if it's a solenoid problem or it could even be an electrical problem here on this board. In fact, there's an entire daughter board under here for controlling the cassette drive. So the bottom line is, I'm sure if I wanted to devote the next year of my life, I could probably track down and fix this problem. But ultimately, I just don't want to. <laughs> And, you know, that's something that everybody's got to come to terms with at some point when you're repairing a project. You've got to be able to draw a line and say, I'm going to go this far and no further. And this is as far as I'm going to go with this unit. I'm, I'm just not going to spend the next year repairing it. So what I am going to do is I'm going to put it back together. And there's actually a slim chance that it may actually work now that the belt's back on. Because there's a few little sensors and there's even a ground wire that connects into there and a few other things that, I don't know, maybe when it's all put back together, maybe it will work. I don't know. Let's find out. After two hours of careful reassembly, I managed to get it all back together again and even managed to superglue that little piece of the function switch back on. 
Unfortunately, the cassette drive still doesn't work. However, I figured if nothing else, I could at least fix this peeling off label, right? <laughs> I thought what I'd do is use some alcohol to clean off the old adhesive just on the part that's peeling off and then apply some new adhesive and stick it back down. Well, one thing I realized is that this label was barely hanging on at all, so I just pulled it the rest of the way off. Uh, then I cleaned the remaining adhesive off the label. My plan was now to mask off the area around this and use spray adhesive. Unfortunately, my wife had used all of my good adhesive on one of her craft projects and bought me this new adhesive to replace it. It was not tacky at all, just like spraying water actually. I thought maybe if I put some weight on top of it and let it dry, maybe that would help. Well, a few hours later, I checked it out and uh, it wasn't even adhered in any way at all. So yeah, I'm going to chunk that spray adhesive she bought me. I guess I'll resort to a simpler method and just use double sided tape. I'll coat the entire area and then trim the excess away with a knife. And that actually seems to work really well. However, I'm sort of disappointed that I got some alcohol on the front of the label and it almost immediately took off the markings for the serial number and voltage. So I used my label printer and I made a new serial number and badge. It's the same number as before as I wanted to preserve the number for this unit. And uh, so here we go. Looks like I got a little crooked, but the original number was too, so I guess I won't worry about it. And uh, of course, here's the voltage label. Well, uh, this doesn't look perfect, but it's better than it was a few minutes ago. Okay, guys, well, I guess that about wraps it up. I'm sorry this episode was just a little bit anticlimactic since I wasn't able to repair it. But, you know, I think it's important to show the failures along with the successes when it comes to doing repair work or restoration work because things don't always go to plan and that's just the reality of it. The silver lining is at least I was able to get it all back together without damaging anything internally, so I didn't make the thing any worse off than it was before. So um, anyway, at least you did get to see a little demonstration of how it works. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I do have some great content planned uh, for next month, and I am going to try to do at least one episode a month for this channel. So uh, stick around for March's episode. I think you'll find it more entertaining. <laughs>